We have a bumper song for this tree. So Kirsha just introduced it. And we're going into a series starting today called Levy and Rose. And obviously, you guys, it's not about lingerie. <laughs> Honestly, how many of you thought that when you saw it? Yeah, okay, no, it's not. I mean, maybe it could be if you like work that in, I don't know. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about those lenses that we view life through. It's February, so we always focus on a relationship kind of theme in February. Well, not always, but usually that's, that's what we do. That's what we talk about. Relationships uh, influence and affect our life so much. They're so much a part of our daily life. And so doing them well is really important. But we thought, let's take it maybe a step back and let's look at our relationship with God and how that affects how we relate with people. And when it comes to relationships, when it comes to life, the truth is that we all view life through filters. And Levy and Rose actually means in French, the life in pink, which talks about the rose-colored glasses that we so often wear in life. Um, you've done it, so have I. We tend to look at things and, and we want to see it in a rosy kind of light, and so we filter our lives. We also deal with things in life that have been filtered. We all have been. We live a filtered life. You have been lied to. Did you know that? You've been lied to all over, over and over again. We are immersed in a culture that's telling us things that aren't completely true. <clears throat> And so we all deal with different kind of filters, but each one of us views our life today through the lenses that we've applied or that have been applied to our focus because of what we've experienced. Um, you may have been in a relationship perhaps where somebody told you that you were less than, that you were a failure. Perhaps you dealt with a relationship or somebody in your life who had a loud and influential voice who said things to you, and though you try and try to remove the lenses, if you were honest, you'd have to say that your life is filtered because of that relationship. You've, you've adjusted in order to cope or to survive. That's true for almost all of us in some way. Um, we also live in a culture where we're like literally swimming in untruths. There's the things that we all would agree with probably, or most of us would. Um, that we hear over and over again that, you know, you need more, you need more stuff, you, you deserve more, perhaps. We all kind of know that's true, that our culture tells us that. It's always trying to sell us things. We probably all agree with that one. Side note, I read the most interesting book yesterday talking about how the world around us, and we know this, but the world around us is all, um, it, it operates on commerce. It's, it's money driven, right? And so, so often, the things we read or the news we take in is influenced by blogs, which are all money-driven. And this is totally a side note. I'm going on a track because I just think this is fascinating. But if we're talking about the lenses through which we view life, one of the things is the, the information that we take in. And so, so many blogs are money-driven. They're looking for advertisers or, or big companies to take them over. And so the things they put out are the things that get you to click and go to the site, obviously. And did you know that if there's sad news you're not interested in, we're not necessarily driven to sad things. We're also not, sadly, uh, attracted to happy news. But what attracts humanity in general are things that get us fired up, riled up, angry, things that make us want to post or comment or, or whatever. And so, for that reason, so much of the information that we take in is driven by just things that get you to want to click, but also get you stirred up. And we wonder why we live in such an angry and conflicted society. But we know when we look around that there's, there's filters, there's things. So it's the obvious things, and it's also, I think, Many things that we, we wouldn't even recognize, because sometimes there's just subtle lies that we kind of take in. One of them we would see as Christians is the fact that the world around us tells us that in order to be good, you do good. That good people are the ones who do good things. Well, yes, we should do good things, hopefully. But the Bible tells us that in order 
to be good, we receive the grace of God, that in fact, none of us can do enough good things to be good. The Bible, the truth that we go to uh, when we gather at church, when, you, when you're reading in the morning, tells us a different kind of truth. And so, yeah, we want to be good people and do good things, and yet there is this false morality that we're surrounded by that tells us that in order to be good people, we have to do all the right things according to the society that's loud around us. And in fact, if we don't do those good things and, and publish them and, and make sure everybody sees us do them, then we're not good. How silly is that? But we're surrounded by noise and, and voices, and many of them just aren't true. But because we take them in, it filters the way we see life. So, hi. My husband just strolled in from Valley Campus, which is awesome. <laughs> you should have been here for the song at the beginning. It was like super romantic. Next service. Okay, cool. <laughs> We've been lied to. And then, you guys, we also have been lying to ourselves. And we all do this. Sometimes we, we have to uh, lie to ourselves in order to survive. That's what denial looks like. Sometimes you go through something and you just can't look at the truth. It's too much, it's too big. So we choose not to look at it. Um, sometimes the, the truth feels uncomfortable and we know that if we look at it, we're gonna have to change and so we'd rather not look at it, right? And so we tell ourselves all kinds of uh, untruths or we put filters over how we view our life, or we view others, or we view God. And yet, I think there's this desire on the inside of all of us for truth, to know what's really true. I think we all kind of get sick of, often, not being sure what's right and what's wrong, and, and, and what is true on the inside of us. Um, this year, at the beginning of 2019, the word I chose for myself personally was true. That I want to be true. I want to uh, be authentic and true. I want to know truth. Uh, I want to experience a life that's true, uh, that's, that's dependable, and, and that only comes from knowing God. But I think we all want to know truth, don't we? Anybody else? We want to know truth, we want to live a true life. And also at the beginning of this year, if you were here last week, it was Vision Sunday and, and we got to share the church we see for 2019. And, and one of the things that I put in there because I think it so resonates with who we are as a church is that we are a church that wants to see God. And we know, the Bible tells us, that the pure in heart will see God. And the pure in heart doesn't mean the perfect in heart, it means the ones who do the work of uprooting the stuff and the lies and taking off the false uh, lenses so that we can actually see God himself. I believe that's who we are as a church. And so in February, for the next few weeks, we're gonna look at some of those lenses that we've been viewing life through. And I'm praying that as we do, we will be able to remove some of the stuff that's been perhaps blocking our vision. Um, we'll be able, perhaps, to, to use the lenses of the word and faith that help us to actually see life and reality more clearly. Um, I think of going to get my eyes checked, and I'm really uh, nearsighted. And so whenever I go, I uh, have to do the test, and I'm sure you've all done it as well, where the doctor says, better, worse, than the same, over and over again better, worse, or the same. He does an adjustment, better, worse, or the same. Sometimes you can't tell. It, it clicks into place and you can't tell, is that any better? He goes back and forth. And I'm praying that we'll do like an adjustment in our vision so that we can see better, see God better. Scripture tells us that we're supposed to be working out our salvation. And that's what we're doing so that we can see God better. Because here's the thing. When we do the work to change what we see, I'm praying that we'll do that, then we actually have a vision that can change us. When we see God clearer, and you've probably experienced this before, uh, when we see him clearer, better, when, when he is stronger in our vision, it changes 
what we see and that changes us. And as we change, then we're better suited to change this world that he's put us in. Um, and we're going to look through all kinds of different filters, different speakers, different perspectives, which is valuable always. Um, but as we look at each one, I'm praying that we get a better vision of who God is. Tonight, actually, at our Sunday, our first Sunday night service, which we are pumped about, um, I'm going to preach on, preach on one of the things that I think is the biggest lie, perhaps, one of the lenses that distorts our vision the most. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm going to preach on it tonight, and I'm excited about it. Maybe you should come. Um, <laughs> sometimes we don't really want to look in the same way that I don't really honestly want to look closely in a mirror today at 43. I don't really want to look. I don't really want to. I prefer uh, low lighting when I look in a mirror. I don't like the bright lights or the awful thing that's sometimes in a, in a hotel room that uh, magnifies the view. Gross. I don't want to see it, but sometimes you got to look. And in the same way that sometimes we don't necessarily want to look at our bank account. You know, we log into the app and kind of hold it away like this to see what the balance is. Sometimes we don't necessarily want to look, but when we do, we can see what the truth is so that we can see what we need to work on so that we can grow. Our key scripture for this series is 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 17 and 18. It says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What we look at today in this physical world around us is real. It's true. It's real but it's not necessarily the whole picture. And so in order to see life clearly, we need the word of God, which is what's true, so that we can see properly. We choose to fix our eyes, not on what is seen, not on what is heard and the information gathered in this world around us, but what, on what is truer than that, what is more real than that, which is the eternal word of God. Um, because what we're surrounded with is temporary, but we are eternal beings with an eternal God, with an eternal word that gives us insight and light for our path. So we can remove some of those lenses, perhaps, that are warped and put on the lenses that are true. Amen? Amen. One of the things that I get super, um, uh, well, obsessive about maybe is the right word um, I like talking about a lot is the Enneagram. And I won't go off on this because I know as soon as I say Enneagram, some of you are like, oh, jeez, she's one of those people. And I totally am. I'm not much of a talker, but if you want to talk for a while, tell me what your Enneagram number is and, and we'll have a conversation. But I think it's fascinating. If you haven't heard of the Enneagram, it's like, uh, it's not so much a personality thing as it is, uh, it helps us understand how we view our life the lens through which we view our life. And I've been studying it. And when I first was reading it and learned that my personal type is a nine, so I'm an Enneagram nine, it's the peacemaker. Uh, it's it's the, the personality type that wants peace at all costs, which means that often if something is challenging, I'll just ignore it. I'm the person that would just kind of back away from it naturally. Um, my, the, the sin of the, the Enneagram 9 would be sloth, which sounds gross. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you all the things today. It's sloth, which isn't necessarily like laziness. It's avoidance. If something's hard, I personally just want to avoid it. Talk about putting a filter on it. We'll just deal with that later. Because my goal would be peace at all costs. And as I read about it and learned, I loved learning about that because I want to understand myself better so that I can grow. Do you know what was even more fascinating to me as I was learning and reading is that as I was reading about the type one, I found Rod Dole, who's my husband. <laughs> in fact, it said in the book, is it okay if I talk about you being a one? I didn't ask you before. <laughs> 
As I was reading about it, it said, uh, you know you have a one if in your house if when you're loading the dishwasher, they tend to stand over you, <laughs> waiting for an opportunity to readjust your dish loading work. I was like, oh my gosh. It was like they just read his mail. It was amazing. Rod's a one, which would be the reformer or the perfectionist. And I learned that for a one, because they want to do things perfectly and well and in order and with uh, precise perfection, when a one um, points out things that you could do better or um, encourages you in a critiquing kind of way, a one is doing it to show love. They're actually trying to help you, I learned this. That for them, they feel like they're giving you some insight that you really needed, and that's loving. Now, as a nine who just wants peace and to avoid all the difficult conversations, I had read that as criticism and, and pushing, and all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, is that true? The stuff that I was reading said that for a one, there's such a loud critic in their head that when they put anything out, it's way less than what they hear in their own head. And because they're dealing with that in such an intense way that when they criticize others or critique or encourage <laughs> in a critical way, it's at a really small level compared to what they're actually putting on themselves. As I read that, I went, yes. Some of you are having that moment right now because you know a one. <laughs> Amazing. It's helpful, and I would encourage you, you could study it. There's lots of truth in there. Um, we have been going through freedom session as a church. Many of you are taking freedom, and I'm taking it personally. It's been powerful, and again, I'm learning some of those things that I've just never looked at before that are obviously filters in my life because of things that have happened or things others have said, ways that I've interpreted life. There are filters. And it's, it's important to look at what we're seeing so that we can take off the lenses that are untrue. And as we go through this this month, I want to say this, that when we learn something new, when God reveals something to us, perhaps, that is untrue or false, the goal would be that we look at it and we deal with it so that we can grow. Because we don't study the Enneagram just so that we have like dinner conversations, so we can say, oh, I'm a one, I'm a two, I'm a nine. Oh, fun, that's so cool. Oh, you're such a two, I'm, you're such a 99 or whatever. It's so that we can learn more about ourselves and others so that we can see uh, what's behind all the stuff, all the filters. Because God has made each one of us in a really specific, beautiful, creative, incredible way. When God made you and when God looks at you, he sees the stuff, absolutely. The mess, it's allowed, you're allowed to be a mess. It's okay to be a complicated person. You're, you're allowed to have a past. You're allowed to be working through stuff right now, right here. God sees it and he knows, but when he looks at us, he looks at what he created originally, his original intention for us. And that involves a person who's often put stuff on and we need to remove it in order to move forward. Our goal would be that as we work out our salvation, that we become more and more like Jesus. And in order to do that, sometimes we have to pinpoint what those lies or those filters are so that we can remove them. Amen? Yeah. Uh, but insight is cheap. Just learning stuff is whatever. It's cheap. Um, what our goal is, is to change. That we don't just get information and learn things, but we're focused on transformation. That whatever we learn would change us. This Christian journey is a pilgrimage. We are moving. We're on a journey. We don't stay the same or stay stagnant. But our journey is from who you are today to who you're becoming. From who you are today, the goal in mind being that you'll become more and more an, a better, more accurate representation of our Jesus. And in order to do that, whatever information we take in, the goal would be that we allow it to change us. We're on a journey. Um, this isn't a student kind of life, a classroom kind of life, but this is a workshop. 
I pray that whenever we come to church and we gather, as we learn things, as God reveals things, that we wouldn't just write it down and feel like, yeah, okay, check, got that, I learned that, but that we'd take it and it would become tools that we would change and grow and become more like Jesus. And the first step in this journey is repentance. Repentance. Can you all say repentance? repentance. Big word. Sounds scary sometimes, repentance. But in order to see things the way I believe God wants us to, the first thing he calls us to do is to repent. And to, to repent or to change or to turn isn't uh, an emotion. It isn't to feel sorry for our sin or to feel sorry for what we've done. It isn't shame. Repentance is a decision. It's a decision uh, that we make when we think, um, and really repentance is a thinking, it's a pondering on. We learned about it in Freedom Session this week, which is powerful. Um, It's a deciding that perhaps you can't do this thing on your own. Repentance is a a deciding that that maybe you've got it wrong. That maybe the assumptions that you had about life or or the ways you've been trying to be good, do good on your own, aren't the right path. Repentance is a choosing to see Jesus. And it's a deciding that Jesus is telling the truth that Jesus is truth. That's where we start. Because in order to change or in order to remove the garbage that we view life through, we have to see Jesus, see him. He said that he is the way. He is the truth. He is life. And I'm wondering, as we begin this series, if you can see him, because that's really all that matters, that we put our eyes on him. People have said things, the news says things, the blogs you read has all kinds of information for you, social media, all the stuff. Your friends who have opinions, some of it's good, some of it not so much. But it starts with seeing Jesus himself. And I'm praying that we would see him, really see him and the way that he looks at you today. Can you see him? He's the truth. And if you look at him today, in light of all the other stuff, all the voices, all the challenges perhaps, all your own like default settings, if you look at him and see him, it will change you. And once you see truth, I don't think you can unsee it. In fact, I think once you see what's true, if you choose not to follow it, it creates a life of dissonance where the the thing that we know we're called to do uh, grows wider and further apart from the way that we're living or the choices that we're making. Once we see truth, if we choose to really look at it and see it, if we don't choose what's true, I think it creates a really uncomfortable life. Not that we want a comfortable life, but it it creates that kind of uh, unrest, dissatisfaction on the inside of us. And if we choose to decide that Jesus is telling the truth, what he does is he allows that to come on the inside of us and change us. Psalm 51.6 in the Passion says, I know that you delight to set your truth deep in my spirit. So come into the hidden places of my heart and teach me wisdom. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And here's the good news. What God reveals to you, he intends to redeem in you. The alternative to seeing truth and then changing as it requires is to live an untrue life. And Ephesians 4 in the message describes what this looks like. It says, and so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch, not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. 
Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. But that is no life for you. You learned Christ. That's my prayer, that we would learn Christ, that we'd see him and we learn him and we grow in him. My assumption is that you've paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has got to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. What this adds up to then is this. No more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. This describes so much of what we so often see. And you know what? The people in your life, the world around you, this may look familiar because apart from Jesus, that's exactly how we live. We get obsessed with all kinds of things because we're looking to fill something on the inside of us. We listen to all the voices because what else would we listen to? Um, We feel a dissatisfaction because outside of Jesus there is no true satisfaction. That's exactly how we live apart from Jesus. There's no judgment. That's exactly how you would live. But once you see and choose to see and once you know your savior, Jesus, and once you put your eyes on him and, and listen to him and allow his, the vision of who he is to change you, you can't unsee it. And we have to live in a different way. So my question today is this, can you see him? And are you willing to look at him? Because if you look at him, and if you look at the word that he's given us, you, you can't not follow it going to make you really uncomfortable. But that's a good kind of discomfort. Because when you see him, when you choose to change according to who he is, and change the the way you see life, it will change you and allow you to bring change to this world that needs it so desperately. 